it's my pleasure to now turn to Jim G, from whom I continue to learn. Sadly, I could listen to stuff about myself all day, but we have to do something else. Um, you know, and it's great to be in Nebraska for the first time. Uh, in, uh, and we're here at a very weird time in our uh, history and in uh, the global world. Uh, and it reminds me of a, a story, that, not a story, of an episode I heard you know, many years ago when I was a theoretical linguist and doing stuff on headless relative clauses and naked infinitives. Uh, that a very famous linguist named Morris Holley, uh, who founded generative phonology, an old, very curmudgeon -y guy, was giving a talk, and a young upstart linguist at the end of the talk said to Morris, well, uh, nothing that you said is novel. Of course, this is because he was summarizing the field he had created. Um, and uh, Morris Holley said, what I have to say to you today, uh, I didn't come here to tell you the news, I came here to tell you the truth. And we're at a time in education where uh, the truth is not the least bit novel. We know it very well, and yet it's the news. And that, I'm going to try to argue to you, is dangerous. When, when we take what is obviously the truth to, uh, and ignore it. Now, I want to start with a theme that will run throughout this paper. This is the, all the themes of this this talk are really going to be about what I just said, the weird world that we're living in, and the fact that we know very well what the truth is. Our problem is not, in education, our problem is not discovering anything new. It's getting people to pay attention to the old, right? I, I'll try to convince you that. But one of the big themes is the best way to make the situation worse is to keep talking about schools. Because one of the things that we have known for decades is that what, what you do in school matters. It makes a difference, but the factors that are going on in a kid's life at home and in society always swamp what you could do in school. This goes back to the first grade studies 40 years ago. Home-based factors always swamp school-based factors. Another way to put it is when you are advocating for school reform, not any society will take the schools you want. Now, in a society that we have today with the highest levels of inequality we've had in our history, where 400 families own 60% of the wealth in the country, and this is getting worse, when you say, I have a great ed reform that is going to give people the ability to participate in school and to become equal participants in our society, no, you're not, because a society like this will not accept a school like that. And the, if you keep talking about ed reform and school reform, and not what society has to be like to have these schools, what you do is you take the focus off the society and the politicians and the elites who are destroying it, and let us debate teacher accountability, right? whether you're conservative or liberal. So one of the arguments is, since we educators have known for decades that society and school are married, and that societal factors, home-based factors, are as important or more important than school-based factors, we have got to take the debate to the society as a whole and not keep debating whether schools are good or bad or anything. All right, now uh, that's just kind of a, a major theme here. Uh, I have worked on uh, the issue of digital media and games for a little while now. And it is a heartbreaking thing in many ways because this is where we get to Hallie's comment. Uh, as a person who's worked in literacy, and many of you have worked in literacy, we know very, very well how books work. Why? Because we've had them for a long time and we've studied them to death. We know how they work. We know a lot about literacy. We know a lot about reading. And books, by the way, are a technology. Now, isn't it weird that all that we know about books has not been applied one iota to digital technology? We study it as if it is a new technology altogether. It has nothing to do with what we do about literacy. And what I'm going to try to convince you is that new literacies, new digital technologies, things like games, work just the way we discovered books work. So that it's a little appalling we don't 
apply what we know. We produce, it's like, you know, there's people doing the old literacy and people doing the new literacy, but they work exactly the same. I'm going to tell you what I think that is, although none of this is new. Now, to get at why they're the same and why we should pay attention to that, and, and to get at how old news needs to become new news, let me take some stuff that is that nobody in the room is going to dispute whether you're a conservative or a liberal, because again, this is research that has been around decades. And one of the things we know, any literacy person knows, that many, many things correlate with how well your kid, but many things before five or before your kid goes to school correlates with school success, right? We could just put dozens of correlates. But if you ask, what is the most robust correlate with how a child will do in school, not, not in first grade, but in second grade, third grade, high school, college, and life? The biggest correlate we know, again, this is not news, is it is, there's two ways to put it that sound different, but I'm going to argue to the same. The biggest correlate is the oral vocabulary of a kid at the age of five. The <coughs> biggest correlate for success in literacy has nothing to do with print. It's the oral vocabulary of five. Now, there's another finding, because, you know, they come out of different micro communities who never communicate. After all, this is academics. Uh, uh, is that the biggest correlate is the number of words a kid before five has heard from an adult. But of course, those are the same. Why are they the same? Well, when you say that the biggest correlate is the oral vocabulary of a kid at five, you, that's a very misleading figure because, in fact, there are no five-year-olds that do not have spectacular vocabulary. What it means, see, every five-year-old knows the word cookie, and they know how to get a cookie. What it really means is how good is your book vocabulary? How many book words have you heard from an adult? It's the vocabulary that gets you ready for school if you're into this tier two words. It's those words, when they say oral vocabulary, they're not talking about cookie. They're talking about emergency, process. Right? They're talking about the words that you're going to see in books that some families hear and other families, like the one I was raised, that never hear right, when you're little before five. So they're really basically the same. So uh, we know that, by the way, that in the, in the, the reading first, No Child Left Behind regime, post Bush the minor, uh, the, uh, that plays no role in literacy because uh, the word that literacy people use for that type of finding is emergent literacy, and emergent literacy is not evidence-based. By the way, it's probably the area of literacy for which we have the most evidence of all. But it's not evidence of uh, Now, so let's put that aside. Let's put the talk business there and wonder why we've known it for 40 years and don't do anything about it. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you it applies to digital media, too. Now, the other thing that, again, is a wholly different field and is 40 years old as well, and is only now recently have people in literacy and people in this field got together, uh, is the so-called area of non-cognitive skills. There are certain skills that are non-cognitive in the sense that they don't seem to have to do with content of the school type, and they are not correlated with IQ. Uh, and it's skills like, this comes from the famous marshmallow test. If you know that, these are 30-some years ago. We could give all of you the marshmallow test right now. Personally, I fail it all the time. I'll just take the first marshmallow. But uh, the uh, marsh so skills like the ability to get engaged in delayed gratification, the ability to have what's now called grit, that is to persist past failure, the ability to accept and put up a challenge, those abilities are usually developed before the age of five. That's why the marshmallow test was done on three-year-olds, right? So, uh, and, but not all kids have them. Now, why are those skills interesting, the so-called non-cognitive skills? Well, because they also correlate with school success forever, right through college and with society, right? If you've got them, you do well, and if you don't, you don't. But they're more interesting than that because What's weird about these skills, which are normally in place before five, is they're totally malleable. So, you know, there are people who say, well, IQ is not malleable. That's not true, but okay, let's, uh, even if IQ is not malleable, these skills are malleable. You can get them after five relatively easily. 
uh, and they correlate with your success at school better than IQ. So who cares? Who cares about IQ, right? So this is an interesting thing because these skills are foundational to the success of school and they're malleable. We can give to kids who don't have them. Why don't we? Right? But we don't. Now, interesting, two totally different bodies of literature, one out of the mindfulness literature in psychology, one out of literacy. And so the literacy people say, well, you know, it's talk with adults of a certain type uh, that gives rise to success. And then the site people said, no, it's non-cognitive skills like delayed gratification, uh, putting up with challenge, persisting past failure that give rise to success. And you say, well, wow, do they have anything to do with each other? See, and at first, they don't sound like they have anything to do with each other. And that's because the people who do them don't talk to each other. <laughs> However, here's what they have to do with each other. If you go look in the literature on non-cognitive skills enough, Non-cognitive skills are argued to be developed by a certain sort of parenting called nurturing parenting. And nurturing parenting, if you look at this literature, is parenting where adults talk to kids in a certain way. Right? These are exactly the same results. What they're really about is a form of interaction in language that some adults have with some kids. And that that interaction, whatever it is, I'm going to tell you what it is, because again, there's no news in this talk. Uh, it's, people know this. But that form of interactivity is the foundation of non-cognitive skills and of literacy and a society of social success. And by the way, bad news for people who think digital media is the newest thing in town because we haven't even got a toy here yet. It's just a tongue and two bodies, right? Now, so the real issue here is interactivity. Certain sorts of interactions between human beings between children and adults gives rise to successful, resilient people and certain ones. Now, that's interesting for somebody who later went on to work in video games, because of course video games are part of the of interact, interaction. They're part, they're interactivity. They're part of the media interactivity stuff. So, now, I told you, boy, this was not new. <laughs> uh, so Plato already knew this, right? I mean, Plato, Plato's an interesting guy. Besides being a fascist, he had some good points. And the, one of the things about Plato is he's, one of, he's not the first writer in Western civilization. He's one of them, and he's early. And he's pro arguably the first good one, the first really good writer. And he did not like writing. He had all sorts of nasty stuff to say about writing. And I, in some of it, I won't burden you with. But here's one of his biggest problems with writing. Besides that it'll destroy memory. But, but that's OK. Uh, memory is destroyed. By my age, you don't want to worry about it. Uh, the, uh, he said, look, the trouble with a printed text, well, not printed, he had no printing, written. Uh, the trouble with a written text is the same trouble you have with a painting. If you say something to it, it won't say anything back. Right? You can't say to the, the written text, well, why in the hell would you say something like that? It, it won't say anything. It won't answer back. Right? And oral language, of course, is at its core responsive. If I say something to you, you can answer back. So he said, look, the trouble is, and that what he meant was uh, that texts, written texts, are not dialogic. Dialogic in the sense that they won't respond. Uh, now this Plato, uh, he would have liked video games because video games are not like written texts and they are not like uh, paintings. They are like oral language. They respond. So this is Chibi Robo, my, one of my favorite games. Uh, you play in this game a four-inch house cleaning robot named Chibi. Uh, it's great you clean the house. You have a toothbrush. And um, you know, you think, all games are violent, right? You want to know whether TV has a gun, he has a toothbrush, right? It's a great game. He also has to make the family happy. He's in a dysfunctional family, and he's got to make them happy as well. Now, in Chibi Robo, like any video game, it'll start with a pretty picture, and it will do absolutely nothing until you do something. And then when you do it, it'll do something back. And if you don't pay attention to what it does back, you lose. Right? See, by the way, I'm going to argue to you, this isn't novel either. 
That's exactly like the real world. In the real world, you do something and it does something bad, and if you don't pay attention, it can bite. Go ask New Orleans. Go ask New Jersey what happens when you don't pay attention. You know, we kept heating up the world. The world kept saying, keep that up, and I'm going to get you, and it's got us, right? So video games are like the world. You act, and you better pay attention to its response. You better shape the next thing you do by how the game will respond to you. So um, Plato would have said, well, this is something you can interrogate. The world is something you can interrogate. But he was saying you can't really interrogate written text or paintings because they're, they're, in, a, they're in a sense mute. All right, now, um, as I was telling Guy, this is an interesting thing about the ephemerality of meaning because uh, I was in Brazil recently and I said, you know, who is this? And of course, every Brazilian can yell out his name. And I figured every American could. So I was in a talk recently, American, and I said, okay, who is this? And people yelled out, Henry Jenkins. Well, it's Paulo Freire. Um, and, and, you know, he used to be well known. Am I, am I, you know, I could see a lot of you don't know. How many people have ever heard of this guy? Thank God. That's why I'm gardening, by the way. That's why I'm gardening. If this guy only got remembered to now, what's going to happen to me? <laughs> now, Paolo Ferreri did a very interesting thing. And by the way, I, it's, you know, it, he, he was a person I knew personally a, a bit and had some time with him. And he was truly amazing human being in terms of his orientation to life and to society that was really, I think, poorly understood by uh, his American followers. You know, even though they knew him well, they were orientated to American academics. And what's interesting about Carlo Freire, it has not been said much about him. So we read him, as he wanted to be read, uh, politically. So when he says, you know, reading the word and reading the world are important and related, and very often, in fact, you have to be able to read the world before you can read the word, we take those as political statements. And he meant them as, you know, that's the way you can revise, transform your society. But he was actually way ahead of his time because those statements today do not need to be read politically at all. They are absolutely empirically verified now in the psycholinguistics and psychology literature. Right? So um, here's why for you reading people. Uh, there is only one aspect of reading that is neurologically unique to reading. And that's only if you have an alphabet, namely phonics. Right? There's a part of the brain that can associate letters and sounds, and it is uniquely recruited to alphabetic reading. Every other aspect of reading is not recruiting any part of the brain that is not already used in the world. So all of your faculties to do comprehension, you comprehend language just the way you comprehend the world, and just the way you comprehend oral language, you comprehend written language. The same capacities, the same stuff. So it means quite literally that reading the world, that is understanding stuff, and reading the word are identical if we mean understanding. Right? So this is not a political comment alone, it's absolutely true. Now his comment, this is going to be very crucial to my talk, that reading the world precedes reading the word is also <laughs> psycholinguistic true, and this message is fundamentally ignored in our schools and in our society. And the reason it's fundamentally ignored is if, if you did want to produce inequality through literacy, the fundamentally best way to do that is ignore this. I'll show you that in a minute. And you do know we're very good at producing inequality. Uh, now, just to show you that Pat Freire's reading the word and reading the world are the same and that you read the world before you read the word, this is how psychologists say it. This is why they have nowhere near the impact of prayer. Right? They say it in godly I, I'm not going to even read that to you because some of you will weep. But the fact of the matter is, the, the, the trans, here, here is the translation into everyday language of that. Reading the world precedes reading the word. That's his translation. That's just how they put it. Just to show you. See, it doesn't sound as political when they say it, does it? All right. So, um, why is it important? See, this is, this is, this is crucial to know. If you don't get this, 
then it, we, we fail. Uh, why is it important that people read the world before they read the word? Well, the, the technical way that some people put this is to talk about two types of meaning that you can get from language. One is what I will call verbal meaning. Verbal meaning means that if you get some words, uh, you, the, you can understand the words through defining them in other words. Right? You can fill in for each word a definition or some other words that paraphrase it. Right? You can trade words for words. By the way, this is fundamental to school. We trade. You don't understand something, you get more words. You don't understand a text, you get another one. Right? So, uh, verbal meaning is verbal meaning. However, that is not the way humans understand words when they're going to really understand them, when they're going to use them, when they're going to have power. When they understand words in a useful way, like gardening, humans have what's called situated meanings. They don't associate the word just with other words. They associate it with an image, with actions, with experiences, with embodied experiences, with goals, with stuff they've done. They associate it with the body and with experience. And when you do that, if you can associate the words in a text, or oral words, with images and actions and goals, you understand the text in a way that is far deeper than if you have verbal understanding because you can do something with it. Now, I'm going to give you, I could give you a lot of, you know, evidence for this from uh, psychology, but it would all be in that language we didn't like. So I'm going to give you some evidence from capitalists, who, by the way, you know, if there, but by the way, we, America's not a capitalist country. Capitalist countries have free markets. We don't have free markets. We have free market politicians. We don't have free markets. In every area, there's five to four to five companies that monopolize that area. So we, don't, we, we have a lot of people who like free markets. We don't have any free markets, but someday we might have. And um, the, uh, so what is this up here? A Yu-Gi-Oh card. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a card game that can be played on a video game or in person. It's very, very complicated. 10,000 cards. Uh, it's like Magic the Gathering. Uh, you can't play it if you can't read the card because uh, you have to, what you do with the card is determined by what you read. Adults can't play it because the print's too small. And so this keeps the kids uh, at it. Now, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game uh, that is, well, it, you know, it was like Magic was originally for college kids. You know what happens in our culture? You make something college kids, and then your kindergartners playing it, right? So now I took this card off a seven-year-old, uh, and uh, these cards are written in PhD language. See, what idiot would make 10,000 cards they want to sell written in language that isn't total academic not legal? But this company makes money hand over this. Uh, here is one of them just one of the 10,000. And what makes this language incredibly hard is that not only is every term a technical term, but it's the worst sort of technical. And every word sounds like it has an everyday meaning, and it's exactly not the meaning it's got. Uh, when this, this is a seven-year-old, so you have to know what it means to play it. And then when you want to get into a fight with the player about strategy, you have to debate it. So, uh, when this card is normal summon, flip summon, or special summon successfully, select and activate one of the following effects. Select one equipped equip spell card, destroy it. Select one equipped equip spell card and equip it to this card. <laughs> Who knows? You know, I tried to play this game my, when my kid was uh, seven. And we played it on, uh, uh, you know, together. But he would beat me so, he was teaching me. But his way of teaching was to beat me so fast. I couldn't learn, and then to say, Daddy, you're doing great, let's play again. <laughs> Kids. Uh, now, the thing is, think about it as an educator. We have billions of dollars in No Child of Reading for to get kids to read decodable texts. The Yu-Gi-Oh! company comes to your seven-year-old and says, would you like to read this? And by the way, I don't know if I brought it, but if you fight over the rules, you get, you get to, I didn't bring it, you get to go to the internet and read stuff that's amazing. Okay? Now, so the Yu-Gi-Oh company, 10,000 cards, says, oh, if, I, you know, if I'm going to make money, I'm going to teach your kid to read at any level he has to read to make me money. Right? Now, how do you teach? You know, guess what? They don't have phonics books. They don't have decoding effects. What do they do? 
The card game itself has, for every piece of this word, a motion of the body that you do. Furthermore, they make books, movies, and television shows. They have dramatic stories that do no more than enact the rules. So by the time, and, th and then when you get to debate them, you don't just debate what flip seven means. You say, well, look, I flipped it over, I flipped it over. You, you saw me, I'll flip it again. See, th by the time you're finished, every one of these arcane words is married to images, actions that you have goals about, care about, fights you've had in the game over the language. And the kid is seven and can speak it natively. And as I know, I said to the two kids I ripped this card off from, I said, she's you know, as a linguist, I'm so impressed and how complex the language you guys can read and use is. And the kids said to me, what are you, crazy? This language isn't complex, it's simple. That all of a sudden hit me, wow, there's a theory here. See, look, when I first started playing video games, I did the stupidest thing you can do, but what every baby would do, because I did it, it started in my 50s, is I read the manual. Right? And I, I thought, well, okay, here's the manual, and guess what? This is terrible because I know what every word in there means as an English speaker. I know it. I don't even need to get the dictionary out. But I have no idea what this means. <laughs> Furthermore, this is, nine, it was 99, well, it was 20 pages with 199 bolded headings, all of them technical, all cross-referenced to the other one. So by page 5, you completely forgot the page 1. So I said, how can I play a video game? I can't even read the book. Right? But then I did what any kid would have done. I played the game and I played it badly. But after hours when I picked this book up, I could not remember what was hard about it. It was completely lucid. Why? Because I could associate with every word and phrase in it, an image and action and experience and goal from the game. In other words, I had lived in the world that the book was about. And what hit me, and should have, because I've been doing literacy for a while already, should have hit me before, is that's exactly the trouble with this. Academic language, the language of our textbooks and our schools, we hold that the problem with teaching them is that they're hard. But they're no harder than Yu-Gi-Oh! And the argument is the same. If you have lived in the world, this language is about, this is geology, this is a high school textbook. If you lived in the world this language is about, you have images, actions, tasks, goals, and stuff to see, and you don't consider this language the least bit difficult. Just lucid as that gay man you was once I played. But if you did not live in the world of this language, then it is arcane as hard as the Yu-Gi-Oh language you just saw when you haven't played Yu-Gi-Oh. And that hit me that the way that what we do in our school it, see, what, I, what I'm saying is geology is a game. It's connected to practices and stuff you do. And if you don't do it, you don't learn the language. We, school is about giving kids the manuals for games they never see. Now, you just go, you can try this at Christmas if you have a young kid. Just give them the game manual. See, I, Johnny, I couldn't afford the games, but I have these 10 game manuals. <laughs> see when you're... <laughs> so, now, by the way, that what, so what I'm saying is, reading the wor world, that is, getting images, actions, goals, precedes reading the word, if you're going to get situated. I told you there's no news here. All right, now um, to digital media. We have learned, how to, from the video game industry and from stuff, how, just as Yu-Gi-Oh has learned how to make people really smart uh, and, and in ways that are really going to uh, put pressure on schools, we are doing a ton of stuff uh, with digital media that is making people very smart. This is Folded. How many people have heard of Folded? So Folded is a game where you fold, uh, you know, discovering the structure of proteins is crucial because everything in your body, disease and health, is regulated by proteins. And, uh, and the trouble with the protein is that we know what chemicals are in them, the string of chemicals, but the chemicals' effects have to do with how the fo protein folds into a 3D figure, like Norcami, Thing. And unfortunately, in principle, any string of these chemicals can fold into literally billions upon billions upon billions of shapes. You've got to, scientists have to discover just the one that is the low energy state of the protein. So that's the one that will have its effect. So they use supercomputers. They just churn for 24 hours at a time trying to define that. Some guy had the idea, let's make it a video game and have people use their pattern recognition skills to fold the protein and see if they can discover the, the right fold. 
well, this worked. These are amateurs, right? They're not PhDs. These are people just wanting to play a game and contribute something to the world. And in one of the contests they hold, where the scientists bring their supercomputers, uh, uh, three years ago, the gamers won seven of the ten slots. They have chemicals no one knows, proteins they don't know, and you have to solve it. They, they won seven of the ten slots. And last year, a guild, that is players playing together and sharing knowledge, discovered one of the leading proteins that causes AIDS that Pete scientists have been trying to discover the structure for for 20 years. The gamers may have uh, solved AIDS. Uh, the guy who invented this said the day will come where gamers will win the Nobel Prize. They're all amateurs. Now, there's also this, though. This is the best-selling game in history. By the way, you've all heard of Grand Theft Auto, a fabulous, fabulous game, but the only game the media has ever heard of. Uh, and uh, Grand Theft Auto has sold many, many copies, but nothing close to this. What is this? The Sim. Uh, and a sim, the Sim is a simulator of life and families. You build your own environments, houses, clothes, families, and you act out a life and you set goals and do stuff. And what the Sims does, which is very typical, I'm just using these two examples, typical of a certain phenomena where everyday people are getting creative and getting smart and doing stuff, uh, is you don't, lots of people don't just play the Sims. They begin to organize together in what I call affinity spaces, that is interest-driven groups on the internet usually. They don't have to be on the internet, but often, it, it, because you know, people, that guild that sold the AIDS protein, they were people that went on a site and the internet and began to get really excited about the game and share tricks, share strategies, share knowledge, learn stuff. Then they went back in the game and solved things. Um, in this game, people do all sorts of stuff. I could give you billions of examples. One thing they do is they give each other challenges. There's one challenge where you have to kind of reprogram the Sims to, by the way, 56% of the players of the Sims are women, girls and women, if you think video games for boys, the best-selling game in history is the majority of players won. Um, they, the challenge was you had to reprogram the game so that you could lead the life of a poor single parent and get your kid out of the house successfully and successful in life and a bonus for going to college. And uh, then if you did it, by the way, this is very hard to do because this is a commercial game. Being poor is unfun, as many of us will get to discover. And um, therefore, they don't make it easy to be poor. <laughs> Um, so you have to do a lot of tweaking. You have to have a lot of rules. And then, if you did succeed, you, because th this, you can, with The Sims, use 3D software to take the pictures and write books with them, with pictures and books like a graphic novel. You have to write a graphic novel describing how your simulation worked in the life story of your, your kid. This was, by the way, called the Nickel and Dime Challenge. It was, it was the way to enact Barbara Einberg's book on inequality. It sounds like a great social studies assignment, doesn't it? doing it for fun, right? And, and so they can discuss poverty. And one of the things that's really amazing is some uh, women wrote in and said, you know, um, I just, I have a little child. I am a poor single mother. It's a struggle, and this really captured it, and I'm saving it. I'm going to show it to my kid when he's older so he knows what it's like, right? So those are two examples of phenomena that uh, people are organized it's, it's what we're seeing is that when people like a game or any other digital thing, they don't stick with the game. They go to an affinity space to take it further, to modify it, learn more, critique it, get into a guild with other people to learn stuff, build stuff uh, with each other. Uh, and, and, and if you look at these, and I call it an affinity space, because these are spaces in the internet where people are there because they share a passion. Not because of their age, or their race, or their gender. They're there because they share a passion for the Sims, and they want to do and make and not just consume. And what's interesting about affinity spaces, I mean, remember, one just solved one problem with AIDS. Others have done many other things. Um, they uh, are organized for learning in a radically different way than schools. And here, here is just some of the features the best of them have. They're, they're organized around a passion. Everybody is supposed to produce, not just consume. They give you smart tools. They give you facilitatory tools, like the, the protein game gives you a folding tool and stuff so that you can get smarter. They're not age-rated. In the sim sites, there's 70-year-old girls and 70-year-old women and 
with that way, men there. Uh, newbies and experts are together, people mentor and get, and sometimes you lead, sometimes you follow, sometimes you mentor, sometimes you get mentored. Knowledge is distributed, you don't know everything yourself, you can have plenty of people to turn to, it's dispersed in the sense that the site lets you have access to other sites where you can find stuff that's not there. Learning is proactive, but always help. In other words, there's not a conflict between giving aid and doing it yourself because the way that you mentor is to make people proactive learners, and then everyone is still a, a learner. And uh, let me just tell you a very quick story, that, although we're running out of time, but that shows this last one. So there's a, it, there's a book I wrote with Betty Hayes, the woman I just married, although we've been together for many years. We were married standing in a creek in Sedona. Uh, we wrote a book on girl, uh, women as gamers that is about amenity spaces. And in there, there's a story about a woman who's 70 and who is a, a shut-in. She left her career at 65 because she got quite sick and couldn't leave her house. Um, and uh, she had granddaughters, six years old, who played the Sam's at the time, you know, said to the, you can buy stuff in the stores or you can make it. And the little six-year-old said to the shut-in grandmother, uh, you know, you go to the stores in this game and um, I, got, I want a potty for my uh, house, for my children in my house, and I want a purple one and they don't sell a purple one. Could you make me a purple one? And she said, what in the hell, make? How would I do so? She, but, you know, who's going to say no to the grandkid? And so she goes on one of these affinity spaces, and it turns out, yeah, you can make one in those days, it's easier now, but you have to go get a 3 d imaging software, uh, like Photoshop, you have to take all the textures apart, you have to do color, you know, it's like a PhD, but you want to do it, we'll help you, and we'll teach you, we won't do it. So, you know, she said, well, she's like, I can't disappoint my kid. So she learns how to do all the stuff to make the purple potty, gives it to her kid, their grandchild, who, by the way, is you know, so popular in the game now with her purple potty. But the, um, the older woman got really turned on by the community where you could learn anything. She decided to stay and design uh, stuff, furniture, houses, other things. Uh, and in, in The Sims, you, you know, with the worldwide community, you can give away what you design because other people can put it in the world, or you can sell it. She gives it away. And when we wrote the book, she had had 13 million customers. She had won many design awards, and she had a little book you could write things in if you would like your stuff, and she had one million thank you. Think about it. She's a shut-in, but she's not shut out of the global world. She's actually now a rock star in design. And, but there, we, we looked at another affinity space, which was very good, too, but it was mainly males. It was really tough love. You know, if you're not an expert tech guy and tough, then get out of here. And so people we know were saying this woman, the name was, you know, her screen name was Tabby Lou. And they said, you know, that Tabby Lou over on that other site, they just adore that woman. They say she's the best. She's no expert. She's no techie. So, uh, you know, I went on, we went to Tabby Lou and said, well, you know, are you an expert? Remember, she's won all sorts of awards, 30, you know, one million thank yous. I'm 65, I've been doing this for 40 years, I've had 14 thank yous. <laughs> <laughs> so, we asked Happy Lou, to, are you an expert? She says, no, of course not. The expertise is in the community. It's not in us, it's in the group. It's in the networking of the group. It's the way we teach and mentor each other. You see, Happy Lou has a 21st century notion of expertise. Right? Now, um, just to give you another example of like birding, because what we are talking about is a much bigger phenomenon. We are talking about what has been called the maker movement. That is, make stuff, don't just consume it. And you can, you can be seven-year-olds and you can make a nuclear bomb. There's, you can make anything you want. Right? Uh, you can fat, there's three ways to print houses today. Right? You can make anything you want, and, and you can be as expert as you want as long as you put in the time. You have the non-cognitive skills, right? But you know, here, but it's also an example of people call collective intelligence. That when you resource people into these affinity spaces in the right way, even though they have no degrees, they are more intelligent than experts. And this is eBird, where people, everyday people, not expert birders, uh, contribute on a little e-thing e e to Cornell bird scientists. <coughs> the birds they see across the country, and then they map all of this stuff together. And this is the population across time of chimney swifts as they spread across the country at different times. 
and it's revolutionizing bird science. They're understanding that, remember, their birds are very imperiled. They're understanding the distribution of this life form in a way that they never could with their computers, with their expertise, because you know what they did? They made everyday people a computer, networked them in the right way. And by the way, these people are not sitting there like drudges. They love doing this. They're now getting to go out in a forest to contribute to science, save the world, and actually send, you know, message somebody else who has a passion they share. This is win-win. It is interesting that we are at a time in human history where we can solve the problem of chimney swifts, but not the problems of inequality in school. But maybe the same method would work. All right, maker movement. Um, all right, here's the end of this uh, talk. Two morals I want you to take with it. The first is technology. What we've known for years is that technologies, and we know this about books, have no effects outside the social systems they're used in. That when a kid is introduced to literacy in a nurturing environment where there is talk from adults about the world and about experience and not just orders and instructions, and where that child is encouraged to relate that language to the world and to books, and where kids are given mentored experiences in the world that prepare them for books, people get value-added literacy. Literacy with power, and success for society. Giving them a book without those interactions, without with, the, with interactions with adults and the world, giving them without those interactions, the book does not have any good effects. Doesn't make you better at school, doesn't make you better in the world. The same thing is true of digital media, and that is that of giving a kid a computer, giving them an iPad, giving them a game, and not giving them the interactions with adults and the world and the intertextuality that is not about ordering or control, but now is about making and producing, does not make, the, is not a value-added form of digital media. The value-added form is interactive, responsive, it's the same truth uh, about books. Now, by the way, if you think that the maker movement is new, and that we didn't have it in literacy, then you didn't know about writing. Uh, writing is the maker movement in literacy, and notice that in the history of literacy, there's no area that we failed worse than in writing. The world is full of countries that have 100% reading literacy. It has never had a country ever and never will in where there's 100% of writing. Now we've failed at the maker movement in writing and we're in a world where every other digital technology is leading a movement of makers. We better go back and teach writing again, I guess. I told you nothing was going to be new. Um, what did I do? Oh, damn it. Oh, I'm going to have to say this without my slides. So, here, here's one of the oldest things we know about reading, the Matthew effect. What's the Matthew effect, those of you who've read the New Testament? What is the Matthew? Where Christ says the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. I guess he did. He did certainly able to read the future, right? He must have seen America. Um, but then he might, then see if he, he would have, could have told us how to invest in the market. Um, at any rate, the Matthew effect is, is, is this, that we know in reading that if you do stuff that will get a kid to be good at reading, which I've just told you what it is, you know, the interactivity with the world and with adults, then the kid gets better and better and better. And if you do stuff that doesn't make it good, they get worse and worse and worse, right? The, so, and the reason that this is obvious, the better you learn to read early, the more you read, the more you're a reader, and the, the less you read, the less good you get. So it's the Matthew effect is typical of literacy, that the people who do well early do better and better, the people who do well do poorly late, I mean, do poorly early, do worse. Matthew effect is true of every technology. Uh, the people who get the interactivity I just talked about, get richer and richer because they build up a store of maker knowledge and then they become makers. And the people who don't get it, they just have access, they don't get it. And uh, what we have learned in America is how to create the Matthew effect with a vengeance. What is the inequality we produce? We have the Matthew effect to the fact now where only a tiny number of people get richer and richer. Right? We know how to do it in our institutions, we know how to do it in our society, we know exactly, and we're doing it with a vengeance with our digital media. But if we know that, we also know how to undo it. And we can undo it if we start saying to the policymakers and the politicians when they want to talk about teacher accountability or how bad <coughs> schools are bad or, or how bad schools are, to say the one simple thing, no, let's talk about you, not us. Let's start there. Thank you.